excellent news hmm. and both of them don't like to call me so that is even better even better <laughs> yeah when i stepped down uh, i told the new ceo prasanna hmm. come for chai pe charcha you know whenever you want hmm. so i just left it to him whenever he would like to come it is fun sometimes you leaving i so i made a i made a uh, sort of a, took a vow that i will not go to sijan office for 90 days <laughs> 90 days yeah. good so oh, nice to see co passengers <laughs> in the line <life>. ah. <laughs> we are talking the same terms so <laughs> exactly so today was a decision board meeting oh i can say either way they forgot about me or they didn't want to call me <laughs> you know who is this guy they forgot to recognize me <laughs> it is almost same here also <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's nice lot of fun And this year, Srijan receipts are forty-three crores. I think we are live as well as Srijan. Yeah. So, um, hi everybody. Good evening to all of you, and Namaste. Come to this episode uh, number five of the Development Sector Dialogue, a series that happens on every fourth Saturday of the month, between five pm to six pm. Our uh, development sector dialogues are an open platform which hopes to bring thought leaders, social entrepreneurs, grassroots practitioners, and social sector professionals engaged with the human and social capital development. While many of us generally know why and what needs to be done in the development sector, dialogues forum will try to address the how part of it. these dialogues are to enable knowledge sharing exchange of ideas highlighting best practices and experience in solutioning and finding some answers to the common and collective challenges the style of this conversation and collaborative interactions with thought leaders and practitioners can result in co-crafting and co-creation of actionable takeaways or learnings these sessions are brought to you jointly by v lead svym and prakalpa saujanya foundation the vivekananda institute for leadership development v lead also viewed as an acronym for vivekananda institute for leadership education and development as these are the three core areas of our engagement v lead is an initiative of swami vivekananda youth movement which is a development organization engaged in building new civil society in india through its grassroots to policy level action spanning health education community development and capacity building of change now a little bit about bili bili is an innovation and capacity building lab where ideas are spawned innovations are nurtured and leadership is encouraged it also encapsulates within it an exclusive portfolio of products and programs across the theme of leadership education and development vidid is a place to come to if you are someone looking to incubate your idea experiment build your skill sets enhance your talent stack contribute to society and make a dent in the sector now about special project Prakalpa Saujanya, which in Sanskrit means Project for Social Goodness, is a nascent not-for-profit Section 8 company launched last year in October 2021 with the endeavor to provide affordable solutions for social sector organizations for sustainable outcomes. The initiative has been started by a group of project management professionals chartered with a mission to enable the development sector by applying proven processes through domain expertise collaborative learning and technology driven empowerment 
The Kelpa has evolved a comprehensive suite of programs focused on enabling, energizing, and empowering organizations in adopting the practitioner's approach with emphasis on delivery of benefits, impact analysis, and sustainability. The Kelpa believes the initiative will enable social sector organizations to develop more effective and innovative solutions and bring about a transformational change across the stakeholders. In previous dialogue sessions, we had luminary leaders who discussed various topics, starting with Dr. Art Balu, Human Resources Capacity Building Commission, Government of India. He discussed about the social sector organizations post-COVID. Then we had the Chief Strategy Officer of SVYM, Mr. Praveen Kumar, who is also part of the task force of the NEP 2020 program in Government of Karnataka, where we discussed about the opportunities in the NEP implementation. Mr. Pramod Kulkarni, founder of SATI, alluded upon building sustainable social sector organizations and leadership transition challenges in NGO. And then the last one we had, Jayashree, founder of the director Asha, and Mr. Basuraj, Commissioner of Disabilities, shared their experience and challenges in disability domain and suggested pathways in taking, tackling some of them. In today's fifth episode, we are going to debate about current economic scenario, which has led to NGOs standing at the crossroads of sustenance on one side, and constraints of growth in the delivery of benefits for the larger society. The question we are attempting to find answer to is, is it the right time to rethink about the development sector? Should the social sector organizations adopt to market-driven approaches when the ecosystem is uncertain and unpredictable? To discuss and converse on this, we have eminent personalities today. On the stage, Mr. Ved Arya, who has been bringing out of the box thinking to Srijan and Buddha Institute, is with us. To moderate this conversation, we have an equally illustrious expert who is not only a technical entrepreneur, but has been an institutional builder and has worked in energizing NGOs for a long time. And we have brought Mr. Tia Anand to this forum for moderate. Here I'm pleased to welcome and introduce the people for today. Mr. Ved Arya is a social development entrepreneur and author who has founded and developed built social development organizations which have been successfully working to transform rural livelihood opportunities and poverty alleviation among the poorest of the poor in India's villages. An aeronautical engineer from IIT Kanpur and a management graduate from IIM Ahmedabad, Ved left behind lucrative jobs from the corporate world in pursuit of solutions for eradicating poverty and providing livelihood opportunities for the rural poor of India. Ved is the founder and former CEO of Srijan. It stands for Self-Reliant Initiatives to Joint Action, which features among the top non-profit organizations in India in the sustainable rural livelihood management space and empowerment to rural women. In 2016, he founded the Buddha Fellowship Program, a unique platform offering a complete ecosystem for young emerging leaders from India's premier educational institutions, such as IITs and IIMs, an opportunity to build development enterprises. Ved is also the founder and managing director of Sijan InfraTech and Development Services, acronym that SIDS, SIDS, which offers HR solutions and strategies to implement rural development programs for the government of India. Ved is a member of numerous international and national academic and government selection bodies and is often invited speaker to many forums. Ved co-authored the book, Human Resource Strategies to Build Pro-Poor Institutions, which is published by Macro Hill Education, which has been very well received and circulated among the various Indian ministries and government bodies. Ved has also contributed articles and papers to the National Advisory Committee, 
the International Food Policy Research Institute, Washington, and the Overseas Development Institute, London. Now, let me also introduce our, our moderator, Mr. Tiar Anand, for the session. Tiar Anand is an advisor, seed investor, and mentor. Anand is an alumnus of IIM Ahmedabad and UBC Bangalore. He served in leadership roles at IT majors such as IBM and PSI, and as president driving a large global business as Mahendra Satya. Subsequently, since 2009, he has been a leadership consultant for transformational growth, product technology companies, and an advisor to SRM University Group, Acquia Group Education, and advisor to mentor to many startups. Education tech and health tech has been his key focus areas. Anand has vast experience in building leading universities, institutions, and professional education as advisor or a CEO of coach. Anand is currently trustee for Swada Foundation, which is focused on the key theme, educate, enhance, and empower by nurturing first graduates from rural families and providing financial help opportunities for bright kids. Anand is a chairman for the Matrix Forum and the chief editor of the Internet of Things for India organization. He is a board member at the Indus Entrepreneurs Time, Bangalore chapter since 2017 and has been a charter member since 2007. He is also the chief advisor for Mitra Cancer Foundation, which is involved in providing cancer awareness and prevention programs across institutions and corporates and patients advocacy and non-medical support services. That's my one in introduction, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to all of you. I now hand over the stage to Mr. Tia Anand to take the proceedings. Thank you, Amar. Uh, that uh, is indeed a very long uh, introduction. Uh, I think uh, we are all a small microcosm in this uh, entire universe. And uh, there's lots that can be done in the sector to improve the quality of life. And I think uh, we have a very eminent person with three decades of sol plus of solid experience in this area uh, to uh, discuss and offer. Hopefully, I'll be able to uh, generate enough uh, uh, debate and uh, points of view uh, as we go along. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks for that and welcome, uh, Ved. Um, uh, to this uh, dialogue today. And I think we will start with, it, it's the social and developmental sector. And uh, I know you have been saying, you, you after Srijan, you named the next uh, venture as Buddha Foundation. And you're very strong that uh, Karuna or compassion as uh, Buddha's chief message is what makes this world uh, a more livable place. And it's at the core of uh, civilizations. So I want to start there because I think the developmental sector and if you're talking about leadership in development, then we're really looking at people, whether they have the core values for this orientation or compassion. And, and if, you, if you believe so, these core values become life mission and from life mission, you get to practices, which is what you have been doing. So tell us a little bit about how will how does one inculcate this and the second part of the question is, when did this happen to you in your career? You know, is it at IIT Kanpur or at IIM or the first job at TCS where we were together? So tell us a little bit about the how and the when of, uh, of this beginning and then we'll proceed. Thank you, uh, Anand. Um, this is very difficult to answer. Quest Value-related questions are not easy because in this particular way that you are asking to bring the spotlight on me is very embarrassing and not easy. And before I start to answer, I must thank Vijay personally. Amar Bhaskarji, I'm meeting for the first time. And institution-wise, it's a great pleasure to be invited. And I'm very honored to be invited by V Lead and Prakalpa Sojanya. We align, we all align in terms of what we want to do together for the for society. But these are lofty things. Things have to start here at heart. 
although in various institutions we are always taught to use our brain analysis or geom analytical geometry is one of the first books uh, if you if many people remember whether it's thomas or krezik what i know engineering students will remember that analysis is the core of uh, of brain and what we can contribute but i've begun my journey uh, maybe foolishly so by sort of uh, be driven by heart so to say uh, and i think many people are now writing uh, uh, articles including an hbr uh, harvard business review about compassion being core to leadership and last 15 20 years you are also seeing nobel prizes being given to behavioral economists increasingly you realize that you have to explain human behavior however uncertain it would be or however difficult it is to explain the myriad dimensions of human behavior so i think uh, compassion why i believe this let me ask our colleagues and friends all of us who are here uh, this is my pet question nowadays that uh, if you see a beggar on the street if you in, in the washington etc you see a homeless person on the on the sidewalk or if you see a beggar on the traffic uh, the, the much celebrated traffic jams in uh, in, in a corner or a cor four uh, street uh, combination you see any traffic junction somebody comes up to you and wants you to bring down the uh, the the window and say whatever what, does your heart beat go up yeah well you 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 do feel a, a sense of uh, you know uh, helplessness a sense of uh, you know guilt feeling of success and failure a, a divide if you may call it between rich and poor you know you are inside the glass house and someone is outside so i guess you do well it depends on that that i think is a function of also core values and how you were made as a, as a human being you know how you evolved as a human being over to you vel so as as uh, friends who are listening must be reviewing their own reaction to what happens to each of them when they are sitting in a car uh, and someone comes up maybe someone is an old woman or someone is a young child uh whoever or a pregnant mother or whatever comes up to you and you begin to respond in whatever way the heart beat goes up or you become uh, heartless or you become calculating uh, whatever it is everybody has a heart and everybody has a desire i believe uh, to do something for the others it is with every one of us corona is is a core to human nature and to human civilization as i have been saying you can't hold the uh, the world together uh, unless we have compassion for each other to me one story i want i tell often is this that when you and i were working on an in tcs uh, tata consulting services uh A funny story is that I used to stay in in Niti because some friends of mine were staying there, and I would take a bus with a friend of ours called Pani, and we'll come up to Andheri and take a subway train to come to uh, Nariman Point, Church Gate, and walk to TCS. One day my pocket got picked. I swore to myself I am not going to commute to office, so I took up an apartment, a shared apartment. in a tall building called buna vista apartment and by the time we had shifted to maker towers i used to walk every day every day i used to walk and see a fisherman colony and uh, you know i am from plains i am from bharatpur so first of all your sensory this thing so i used to not like this thing coming from fisherman uh, quarters etc then i every day i walked and i looked at and looked deeper looked inside and i found that there was squalor this poverty and women were not really bearing anything and children were playing uh, and not really going to school so something began to happen in my heart and i said you know i should do something 
and I began to think that, uh, you know, on one hand, I didn't know how to do COBOL. I hated COBOL. I mean, I hated doing so. <laughs> I hated, you know, one of our friends, Swapna, you know, sticking so many sharpened pencils and writing long code. I said, I'm not cut out. Maybe I'm a very lazy person. I just cannot do it. On the other hand, I thought if I quit TCS, Tata's can always find hundreds of Ved areas. And I said, you know, this is a time to move. And when I got an award in 2018 for Social Entrepreneur of the Year from Business Standard, Ramadurai was the chief of the jury and I told him, you know, you guys did much better because I left TCS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. So Ramadurai would have been proud of you, you know, uh, because uh, once a TCS and yours, always yes. That's true. So you did much more in the social world, which they could not have done. Okay. So good. Um, so shall we kind of move on to the next part? Yes, please. Yeah, I think you, you you answered my question as to where the calling came from and how it happened in a very anecdotal fashion. So I, I think that's a, that's important, and we will address this later when we think of the you know uh, uh, transformation and what is required with the new generation. So let's park that. How do you get the spark in the new generation, the millennials, etc., with so much of you know consumerism and a variety of other things happening in this world? So we'll park that for the time being. And come back to the topic uh, that is assigned uh, today to us, which is the unpredictable world. And that's what, uh, from the time you started three or four decades ago to now, the world has changed a lot. And there's a lot of uh, what the, the, the VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complex and ambiguous world that's happening today. So how do you see this world in the context of developmental sector. So I'm saying, before we say re-energizing this sector, let us look at the unpredictable nature from your perspective, from what is unpredictability here. So you may want to talk a little bit, then we will see how to re-energize it. Yeah. Thank you, Anand. And so um, your name is Anand, which is not changed, right? Which means blissful. You are blissful. <laughs> so the key, key thing is this, how to remain uh, unflappable in uncertain world, right? So, but good to know, good to uh, sort of analyze where we are. And good, this VUCA framework is very interesting. Uh, when world is talking about maybe World War Three, people are talking about Ukraine. Yeah, I know what is really happening, fundamentalism, and uh, what you now Latin America has recently elected a left leader. You know, we begin to wonder uh, what's really happening and what should we be doing? We'll come to that. As individual action always starts from where the individual is, right? That's action is the a human agency, as we call it. And uh, I think from the sector point of view, and sector is not really a, a detached from the world outside. I would talk about uh, four dimensions as far as our sector is concerned. One relates to policy because Amar Bhaskar talked about policy somewhere. So, which I'm going to call regulatory policies are they are getting worse for the social sector, whether FCRA or uh, the way uh, CSR law is being rewritten, more compliance burden, not only on the NGOs, but also on the donors, the CSR people, if you ask them in terms of reporting and how much money they have to give or to be spent within a certain period of time. So one is related to the policy environment. I'm using this cliched thing. Policy, how are we regulated by the government? Uh, and what it, it means in terms of compliance burden. If you don't take the, any ideological lens to it, how does it affect the social sector organizations or voluntary agencies or NGOs, whatever name we call it. And within that, we should know how it is affecting the large ones and the small ones. It is certainly the case that we, we will find that smaller ones find it difficult to cope. The point one is related to regulatory policies. Second related to technology. And we are now uh, seeing that more and more of uh, AI, more and more of machine learning, and more and more of data. What does it mean for the sector? Are we able to keep up with it? Are we seeing good in it? Are we seeing bad in it? What is it uh, who are on, not the techies, not the Oracle types, not the Microsoft types, not the Tesla types, 
how do they see the, uh, the, the, the same thing on the other side? Do they see vulnerability? Do they see opportunities? That is second. And third relates to human resources. As you mentioned, today's young, do they want to do something about society or, or not? We have something. And largely, lastly, people we are concerned about community, uh, whether it's rural poor community or the urban poor, urban slums of it. So in four ways, if you look at this uh, thing, I think uh, the regulatory uh, policies for, for good or for bad are much more tighter, much tighter uh, assumption of the government may be that there are people in the world who are more interested in converting people from one faith to another, right or wrong, but because of that tightening of the policy. Whether, so foreign contribution is, cannot be uh, granted, the permission to receive foreign grants cannot be granted on a platter, so to say. It's not easy to get uh, permission from, there's much more scrutiny for your audience, your friends, I want to say, I'm a member or a convener rather, I would say a promoter of a coalition of 80 NGOs today, which reach 110 districts and almost 1.6 crore people in 15 states. So we tend to, we get every other day, some complaint, I didn't get my FCRA renewal, or they came to scrutinize the board members. Some of them are Christians. Some of them are Muslims. So because of that, there are issues in terms of uh, getting right or wrong. This is the perception I'm talking about. Or they will say that, tell me the mobile numbers of at least five people in every village you've been working and we'll call them as to what you are doing. So point I'm making is that it is putting a lot more burden on the, uh, on the NGOs uh to uh, to actually get this kind of permission now every earlier when we got our atg that means we could get donations from people it was for a lifetime once you got atg uh, and they will get the tax benefit uh, equivalent to 50 percent of their their donation they could have but now every five years you have to renew it you have to go back to the uh, income tax officer and you know what happens so i'm just giving two examples one for foreign contribution, one for Indian donation, life is little more uh, difficult. What can we do about it? We'll come to it later. Technology. I think technology is being seen as, uh, as a job reducer or in some ways, or in some ways it is difficult for people who are work small NGOs who are working in the villages of say Tumkur or villages of Raichu, villages of Hubli they may find it difficult to, uh, so technology means that you should have somebody uh, in your team who can uh, upload, uh, say, video, YouTube video, or who can actually uh, upload your balance sheet more easily, uh, or it could mean that your accounting system is completely online. Uh, whatever it means for a technology, and it is affecting your operation, particularly affecting your operation because the donor wants you to be in a certain way. So he may not look at you uh, sort of in a favorable light if you are not up to it in terms of, and it is interpreted interestingly as lack of transparency if you have not uploaded your uh, balance sheets, et cetera, on a, on a website. Third thing is related to human resources. I think it is most critical for survival and sustenance of organizations uh, to have younger people. Like we, uh, Pramod and I were talking about, we moved on from Sijan and Prerna or Sati. But unless there are young people to take over, uh, with, of course, they'll bring new ideas, they'll bring innovation. Then I think uh, in some ways you are doomed. In the sense of some ways the lifetime's work uh, regrettably will not be continued. So can we attract younger people today? Can we attract, uh, excite young people? My answer to that is, it is not bad at all. In fact, young people are even more socially aware. If you look at the environment, you will see uh, long young people coming up with uh, answers, coming up with activism to respond to environmental crisis. So my answer there is, 
positive about young people, but do we have it in us to attract them to solve the difficult problems? Lastly, I'm saying people, people uh, community are uh, uh, much more aware today, so ever since the onset of TV, onset of mobile phones, but in poverty is still not gone away in India. 30% of the people are seen to be poor. Even if you say 6% of the people are poor as some estimates are, which means about one and a half dollars a day, 100 rupees a day or a little more 100 rupees a day, 6% or more or less is still, you know, how many crores out of 1.4 billion? It will be close to still about eight to 10 crore people. Eight to 10 crore in absolute numbers, you know, when Indian economy is growing by uh, uh, going to be $5 trillion, the fifth largest economy, even though it might be one fifth of Chinese economy, is still to have 10 crore people who live below $1.5 a day is a shame on Indians, Indian policymakers and Indian government and all of us. So I think uh, in, in your framework, I want to say that these are some of the challenges and some of the opportunities also that are in front of us. Okay, so that's a fairly comprehensive picture you painted uh, of the scenario today. So let me just take a, take you up on. I can't. I don't think uh, we'll we'll be able to cover everything today. But let me take up two things, uh, which is technology and human resources out of the four policy. You are adequately covered already, and the policy implications uh, probably for smaller NGOs is going to be a lot more. We'll come to the funding aspect. Uh, there's one aspect of funding which we have not covered, but let me just take up technology. I think while the uh, technology as a job reducer is, is something that we must be worried about and definitely uh, in a country, and you, you've seen in the last couple of years, especially post-COVID, the unemployment rate uh, and the marginal employment rate, you know, not those who are fully employed all 365 days a year or two, is very high. It's going up. You know, whatever the numbers, you know, irrespective of the numbers, we can see that. So, but at the same time, the use of technology for, say, marginal farmer to discover price for his crop and not sell off his price at the lowest offered price is a value today that is being available to him because of his mobile. You know, on his mobile, he can check which Monday at what price. And what is it likely to be, and so on and so forth. And similarly, a variety of things, the direct benefit transfer program, DBT, has enabled a fair amount of transfer to the end beneficiary with minimum leakage. I'm not saying zero leakage, but I think that has also helped. So usage of technology for good is what is required, appropriate, rather than usage of technology which swamps a whole lot of people. For example, uh, hopefully, and this is something that I work with every day, the, the big uh, transnationals are with e-commerce swamping the small and marginal traders, if you will, in that sense, in e-commerce. And hopefully the ONDC framework, the open network digital commerce, will enable every shopkeeper to compete on the same level with, say, an Amazon or a Flipkart to be able to find the customers. You know, what you are able to do today there is suppliers are able to find customers easily and therefore move their product so that there is turnover so hopefully this will technology for good hopefully will help and uh, there are some bad effects we can debate that but i think there are a lot of good benefits which are also reaching the the below the poverty line if you may say so healthcare for example i know we can discuss that and i work a fair amount in health tech if we can really deliver good health tech with telemedicine and at a very affordable cost it will probably going to be useful so i think there are many things that will happen there from technology. Let us take up uh, the human aspect. And I think it's very heartening to hear from you that the young people are more socially aware and how to convert this awareness to action on their part, involvement on their part, and also careers. See, for me and you today, a career is not that important since we've almost done with our careers. But for youngsters, a career, do they have a, really a career in this, in this area? of uh, what you may call, and I think you use the word developmental entrepreneurship. So I want you to be able to log. I look at the traditional entrepreneurship and I mentor a lot of startups. And we have good social entrepreneur, entrepreneurs who are coming up today, whether they are focused on climate change, whether they're focused on go green, et cetera. So let's talk a little bit about developmental entrepreneurship and what opportunities exist for pulling up people and also getting youngsters involved in the developmental sector. Is that a, 
uh, re-energizing? Is that a change? And how will we do it? Anand, you are very clever in not discussing what I want to discuss. But yes, I'm going to answer your question. But this is by way of a joke. This is because we are classmates. We can say things to each other, even in a public forum. Uh, very, very interesting. I want to, uh, I in fact have an example of the two things into one, technology and human resources. You have you also highlighted one issue of unemployment and I highlighted the issue of lack of income of the farmers and so on. Let me give you an example of two Buddha fellows, two development entrepreneurs. And they happen to be from elite institutions, but going forward, we are going to de-elitize Buddha fellowship or development entrepreneurship. So you live in Bangalore, if you go beyond 100 kilometers and 150 kilometers, you will begin to find a, a small landholder, one acre of land, you estimate how much income he'll be making. Anybody here, take uh, just like compassion, I was asking this question. You go to a farmer who is likely to have a, uh, only one acre of land, you know, about 100, 100 million or whatever farm uh, people of uh, farming households have about an acre of land. How much income he would be having? You are, you're looking at others to answer. Most of them can't because they're all muted. Okay. So, so you won't get an it. answer from the audience. So you'll have to answer it yourself. So I'm answering and I'm trying to engage everybody here. So Madhu and I am a graduate, uh, 2018. He said, you know, he's a farmer's son, happens to be a farmer's son. He said, you know, income from paddy rice is 10,000 rupees a year. He says, I want to make it 10x. So he agriculture graduate and he, his dreams became bigger because he went to I am Ahmedabad. You know, I am Ahmedabad does good things and bad things. One thing it does, uh, bad thing is makes you ambitious. So he says, I want to do big things. So uh, he said, I want to make farmers income 10x. He set up a greenhouse, an Israeli style of, of one acre, one acre greenhouse and he's growing Dutch roses, Dutch variety of rose. A Dutch variety of rose you can make, you can you can grow in Holland, you know, but he is growing in Guntu. And you know ambient temperature of Guntu, and he is more known for tobacco and chili. So this guy has uh, he's growing roses, and uh, now uh, he got 10, 60 lakh rupees, 6, 30 from his own classmates uh, from agriculture college, from all humble means, all uh, people have borrowed money, giving up jewelry, uh, etc. And 30 lakh he got from the government. 60 lakh rupees he has put in in that uh, greenhouse. Bowed by success, he grows roses and sells. And how can he sell roses? Because he is displacing the rose coming from Bangalore in the Andhra towns. Imagine this guy is doing this. And now he's setting up two more uh, greenhouses at the investment of 84 lakh rupees. Out of that, 50 lakh rupees has come as investment as in equity. Point I'm making is that he is using technology for good. He wants to make it 10x and he is the human resource best you can find in the country. Young men, young people are idealists as we were in uh, at the age of 21, 22, 23. And they want to change the world. So there is hope. I'm giving you this example. Second example I would give is the, you know, unemployment is high. You look at UP. 20 crore people in one state and uh, you look at the situation of young girls and they go to college. What happens to them when they get married? Even if they've gone to school in a typical uh, tier 2, tier 3, tier 4 places in UP, they'll get married and raise children. Right? That's what mostly they would do. I'm not uh, looking at caste, but you will find mostly that. What Preeti Singh is doing from IIT, Kharagpur, and join Buddha Fellowship, she is teaching the young girls into gig economy skills. We are all techies in Udaipur or in Bangalore, so I have to talk about tech, right? So he's teach, she's teaching them blogging, she's teaching them uh, YouTubing, she's teaching them phot photography, not getting, not only teaching them th those skills, she's getting them assignments and jobs as photographers and weddings, etc., etc. She has already trained 740 girls and she has raised 3.6 crore rupees. 
So I'm giving you uh, positive examples of how young people of India, even if they are educated in colleges like IIT Kharagpur or IIM Ahmedabad, they could have got a job in McKinsey or Goldman Sachs, apart from TCS. These guys are going, they are worse than me. At least I worked in TCS for some time, but these guys are you know, going ahead and you know, I wouldn't say sacrifice. I think they're very excited about what you said from awareness to action. They are aware, but they have taken action to try at least a few years. It's wonderful news I want to share with your friends here. Luka. Good. So those, those are there, but the question is, uh, uh, it will be, I mean, pardon me for saying that, but I think it's a, a, a background of making people ambitious happens in these big institutions. But these are not even a second decimal point one, you know, point not one percent of the education. 14 million, 15 million graduates, engineering graduates who come out of India today, you know, not to speak of the other. So the question is, how do you transform all these into, and we, I'll, I'll stick to the social sector and market-driven approach. So the market-driven, what you've explained is some of these are market-driven and they are market forces, but they're also creating employment locally. So how do we take this to a larger extent and how do they raise funding beyond the traditional so and, and now i come to the ngos and you know the traditional ones and we talk a little bit about self-help groups as well as the microfinance these were all the other areas so in your opinion are these adequate today are there more any more areas where because the funding from donations is only one source you know in, in terms of organizing uh, the people, especially women, and uh, the, in the hinterland, et cetera, right? So are there other, how have these performed today, the microfinance and the self-help groups? Are, it can more be done and from your experience of the RCRC, uh, NGOs that are there, are they utilizing these? Are they using other techniques like, you know, crowdfunding, et cetera? Crowdfunding is a more sophisticated urban kind of word, but how can they access these? And are there, there, there may be several small NGOs people, conveners, entrepreneurs who are here in the audience today, what advice would you have for them? So, Anand, it's a very interesting question. Uh, uh, I want my audience here your, to think in these examples that I have given, what is the uh, message here? The message here is this, that we could be open about looking at technology. For example, and see how we can deploy, employ technology for good use. Just like the word prakalpa sojanya means project management techniques are learned on factory floor, CPM, part, whatever else that is there. But for good, what Vijay Paul, all of you, Amar Bhaskarji has started, how to look at the, uh, the half glasses full, not half glass empty. These illustrates, uh, these examples illustrate that we could be moving, we could be forward looking, we could be always looking at the past and, and bemoan the fact that, you know, uh, we suffer or, or look at half glasses empty and say, oh, government is doing this and, you know, we can have a victimhood kind of a, uh, but I think human nature and human whole endeavor civilization is about endeavor, it's about looking forward, right? So these examples, what I'm giving is that young girls could learn skills like photography, and get a job, get an assignment for a wedding in a three-star hotel or beautician, beauty clinics. So there are these needs of the community you have to identify and tune yourself to uh, find ways to help young people where you said unemployment rate is high, 8% or whatever number you are talking about. Now, uh, so just to give one example, neither from IIT nor I am. So I have, I'm going to meet somebody on Monday from Maharashtra. This guy doesn't know how to speak English. He has set up a seed nursery, a seedling or nursery to, uh, to, uh, to supply plants, say for mango or for pomegranate and all of that. And I am going to give him Vidya Buddha Fellowship because it does not matter whether you have these two horns, or one IIT, one IM horn, it does not matter. 
what matters is the person's grit and determination to make things happen Correct. so this example i'm giving because you can learn new skills and you can earn for yourself you can serve society there may be need for seedlings or saplings or whatever so i think this is important to apply one's mind use the skills use technology to create employment and you can do it at a village level i'm uh, we are saying now mobile phones everybody uses and mobile phones now those uh, young people who have been to bangalore or pune they know how to use mobile phones same mobile phone can be used to aggregate farm food farm uh, produce and you can sell it in a local town because local town will have the need you can collect demand from tumkur you can dem- demand from raichur and you can use the same mobile phone to collect uh, supply tomato or whatever you are growing the two are po- it's possible to de- design apps to de- it's possible to design software for helping uh, people who are migrating to big cities they can actually do small businesses in so that is the example i'm saying going forward such things as you yourself said price discovery is possible on a mobile phone similarly it is possible to aggregate farm produce through apps and supply to consumers who are in the smaller towns i am giving this uh, they are all happening anyway in many places now coming to funding where people might be interested in knowing how the funding is uh, crowd funding or other funding and wow, where micro finance is and where ssgs are i'll give you a scale ssgs are about 10 crore women in the country are now members of self help groups 10 crore 100 million women in their households are, are there for us to look at now already ssg means that they have come together in any work any kind of a marketing you want to do any kind of services you want to provide for it's the platform is available to them out of the 10 crore 8 crore are with the government program called national rural livelihood mission and 2 crore are with the ngos so many of these self help group women are now coming together as what we call nowadays farmer producer organizations or ngos earlier amul cooperative kind milk or sugar cane whatever cooperatives we have heard of in maharashtra and in sharad pawar's area sugar cooperatives or in kheda or other places amul cooperatives why so already this is happening contribution of the ngos could be in making good fpos that means is member centric and the blah 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 whatever it's possible and then once they do the aggregation uh, then they can begin to sell it in the and whatever processing they want to do let me give an example of that now in the uh, if you look at custard apple i'm giving an example uh, the farm uh, produce is one thing but you can aggregate custard apple which is in the forest you can make frozen pulp and the frozen pulp can be made by technology like blast freezing and once you can blast freeze it becomes stone you can store it and sell it to ice cream companies like like whatever natural ice cream and everybody here must have tasted the flavor of custard apple ice cream so what i am trying to say i am giving you the example for the it we can develop value chain starting from ssgs you can make an a farmer producer organization or a or a cooperative you can bring technology to process because there are 12 to 14 or 15% of fruit and vegetables wasted in our country so can we use cooling technologies blast freezing technologies to first freeze them cool them like old time potato cold storage is but not technology is available and then bring it to the so value add so more money is uh, of the of the value chain is given to rural poor people and then use marketing techniques to go out and reach there so what i am saying is innovation is the way we can move forward ssgs can aggregate can into fpos technologies can come in various ways we have described and therefore women can be linked to the market now as far as small ngos are concerned this is not necessarily to be done by large ngos former producer organizations like ssgs you could make earlier you can make fpos also aggregation you can do depending on the commodity there uh, i give example of custard apple but it could also happen in tamarind if it is forest it can be done in millets 
uh, you can process it. Millet processing is a very fine machine. It's a normal atta chakki, whatever flour mill for wheat is not the same. So there are technologies and machines that are for very fine, small grain that millet is, that will pass through a normal processing. But there are a guy called Dinesh Kumar and this is what other people are doing. That processing of the millet is becoming sophisticated. Those machines are available from, I think, from Coimbatore or other places. And that can be used to a process. Uh, there are some fine nuances also I can go into that. But millet is a big superfood now in yes. the US and in India and right. so on and so forth. So I'm sharing, sharing that this possible. Yeah. yeah. So I think, uh, no, you mentioned millet. Millets 30 years ago used to be called a poor man's uh, food. Now it's become more expensive than uh, rice and wheat, you know, today. So it's really the high-end no, oh, you, I'm only into millets means, uh, well, you have evolved, you have, you have arrived in the <laughs> scenario. So, but, uh, but I think your message is, while it applies to the, to the individuals, what you're saying is all the NGOs also in this world have to be part of the innovative cycle. You cannot right. stay put with what you used to do 10 years ago or even you know, five years ago, because things have changed. And technology, appropriate technology is available today. And people are innovating in many, many areas. You've given lots of examples. In the uh, agri-value chain, I, I think we have restricted a lot of the, dis the discussion to the agri-value chain, but I'm sure it's equally applicable in the services sector also. You know, and, and I think uh, healthcare is another services sector which one focuses on, where there's a lot of scope for improvement as the economy picks up. We'll talk about it another day. And also, let me give example, just to remind... Uh, go ahead. Let me give an example because for not that I know much about, but telemedicine 5, 10, 15 years ago used to be uh, used to be criticized. You know, this is too tech. This is not going to happen. I know of a uh, firm uh, which is conceived in uh, the Bay Area, but it is implementing its projects in UP. And it is using an app. Uh, an app is used uh, to diagnose a patient, say, in Lucknow or a district like Bahraich near Lucknow. And the persons, whatever you call it, you know, the, the variable things we are talking about nowadays, but blood pressure and all, all heart rate, everything is done. Within 30 minutes, within half an hour, prescription is given. Within half an hour, prescription is given. What they've done is, They've researched all the uh, Harrison, you know, the book that people read in medical law. Your wife has read, my wife has read, medical doctor Harrison. You look at Harrison, they have put it into a sort of a background. And then any, some hundreds and thousands of conditions, they are programmed. So moment somebody gives symptoms, etc., and some of the data related to the uh, condition with the heart or whatever, it is, uh, that is programmed, that kind of input is given to a doctor doctor sitting in Lucknow in this particular case or wherever they have a list of doctors, in half an hour, they can get prescription uh, and then they can go to a pharmacy or they can uh, buy it off from the same uh, this thing. And it's possible. Uh, the huge, huge success in the healthcare using technology, using research as a backbone. And they are able to provide. And imagine, I'm not giving any data of how many people are not getting diagnosis you and your wife and I discuss about early diagnosis of pediatric cancer is done, then you can avoid that going forward. So I think this is a health is a huge area. We yes. should provide support uh, to our Correct. community. Yeah. Definitely. I think education and healthcare, I, unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss education today, but healthcare and especially chronic devices, for example, dialysis used to be only in big cities, but now so many entrepreneurs, both for-profit and social the Bombay Kidney Foundation and so on and so forth and Nasi Kidney Foundation. Almost everywhere, tier two, tier three cities are available today for people to be able to lead a normal life, you know, in that sense, at an affordable cost. So I think healthcare is another area where both you can do a for-profit, you can also do a not-for-profit and reach some of the solutions which are technology-driven quite a bit. So those are also the things that I think is going to improve the quality of life. Uh, I think we are almost coming to the end of the uh, program right now. I don't know whether there are any questions. Uh, um, 
Vijay and Amar, are there any questions for uh, from the audience that we should take up now? I don't see anything in the chat box as of now. If you have yeah. received any, uh, just no, let us know. No, the, there's none in the chat box. Okay. So do we have a few more minutes to cover uh, one or two points right now? You can go on for another three, four minutes. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I think the other thing that I wanted to ask uh, uh, Ved again uh, is, I know we covered uh, policy earlier. This is an area where I, the government, you know, whether it's at the state state level or at the local uh, level, is also participating in, in uh, stimulating through policy, stimulating through programs, the developmental sector. You know, as you, as you said earlier, self-help group, 80 million is in the National Rural Mission, very large, you know, and uh, the MNGRA and all the others for guaranteed employment are all national. So the government is doing its bit in many areas. What can NGOs in that area do today? How can they get better leverage of the schemes, whether it is information to action, whether it is being able to improve the velocity of delivery of of the several services that are intended by the government and the government has a very large outlay in the sector. What has been your experience and what's your advice to NGOs in this area? So uh, there's a question, we'll come to that in the chat box, but uh, <clears throat> it is, I think uh, NGOs are uh, innovators. They and NGOs can also be part of the large scale government programs. So they, uh, their ability uh, to act locally, their ability to devise solutions to local problems, they should not leave that because they are at the last mile. So I have given many examples earlier, those solutions, those innovations for self-help group also innovation was uh, from the NGO, Muhammad Yunus and Mayrada did here. Uh, just give me one example. So NGOs have to be very uh, conscious of the fact that they also can contribute by innovation. Even though they may be pressed for funds, it is all right. Second is this, that can we work with the government? Of course, you can work as an activist also, where you find the injustice is being done or access to some of the uh, uh, services is not there. Even in Narega, we may find or food security, maybe you can have it. But uh, let me give an example of where you can work together. Jandan Yojana is one of the schemes where the government gave, say, for example, 500 rupees uh, during COVID in 2020. In the RCRC, in the coalition, we mapped how many of the NGOs were able to do in how many places the money was reaching or not. And then we diagnosed that state-wise then we diagnose the problems of why. So in one instance, I'm saying where NGOs can help is, for example, mobile numbers were not updated or up to date with the bank. So even if the money had come, money would not have reached, information could not be uh, uh, sent to the Jandan Yojana account holders. So where government has come up with the direct benefit transfer schemes, uh, another is uh, then why not NGOs can work closely with the government. I'll give you another example. Prime Minister Kisan Samman Yojana, you're supposed to get 6,000 rupees for all the farmers who have the title of the land. So one issue there, it's done very well. When we did the survey in RCRC, and I reported to Amar, shared with Amarjit Sinha, who was in the ministry, who was in the prime minister's office. He was very happy when I said, this Jandan Yojana is doing well, and PM Kisan Yojana is doing well. But then further we can look at it that sometimes what happens, the PM Kisan Yojana reaches the father-in-law and does, daughter-in-law does not get that 6,000 rupees because that's the situation in our feudal households of Uttar Pradesh. What can we do? So the daughter-in-law whose husband, son is gone to Bombay, she is living in Gorakhpur. Imagine the money does not come to her, it stays with the uh, with the father-in-law. Yeah. What so father-in-law does, so what I'm trying to say is not all fathers-in-law are not bad. Rather, many of us are fathers-in-law in our real lives. We are not necessarily cruel to our daughters-in-law. But imagine if it happens at a very large scale, we have to be careful 
in how the social factors of, can impede the real progress of a large scheme of the government. This is a scope for government and NGOs to come together. Okay. I think we have a question in the chat box. Are you able to read it away? Chat? I can read it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead. You may want to address the first one. Yeah. So, uh, what are the best lessons startup founders can learn from failures, mainly in the development sector? I think, uh, uh, of course, uh, one of the uh, issues in the startups like Buddha Fellows, enterprises we find. If I were to look at those who succeeded and are continuing, those Buddha fellows like Madhu and Preeti, I gave examples of, and there are some who, who left, like Ravi and all that. So one way to dissect the problem we find. I think it is important uh, to same psychological factor called grit and determination. You find a solution and try it out. It doesn't work, you try out another solution and uh, that is one important thing is, is stick to it as soon as, as long as you can. So failure wise, Madhu, I, give you, I was giving you example of Madhu. He set up this farm and uh, he ordered the seedlings of roses, rose seedlings from Tamil Nadu. Imagine a truck of seedlings, rose seedlings was coming from Madras to Kuntu. March 20, March 23 of 2020, what happens? Our Prime Minister announces a national lockdown. What happens to the truck? And what happens to the, uh, to the, uh, all the plans of our great Madhu Buddha fellow? He loses the entire truck of seedlings, entire truck, uh, whatever money. And for six months, there is no crop. In his uh, in his farm in his uh, farm, so but he soldiered on. He has continued, and he is living in bachelor's uh, quarters. Imagine with an Indian latrine. This guy is most uh, extraordinary uh, human being, I say. And he doesn't talk much like we used to talk in the classroom in I am Ahmedabad. He no CP. He is very quiet. So. Uh, and there are many other qualities. He's a big team man. He has five of his classmates working with him. So I'm giving you psychological uh, attributes of a startup uh, founder is to not uh, lose enthusiasm, not lose hope, not being, uh, be optimistic. Things will come around. That's one lesson I think we can learn for those who persist and that is where you will find Edison yeah. example 36 times he tried different materials and finally found whatever was working for making yeah. a bulb. Uh, so, so that is one thing I wanted to say. Second is, it, yeah, isn't it? I don't know whether it makes sense what I'm saying by giving one example, yeah. but that's how. So I think the social sector is no different from an entrepreneurship perspective. There are unknowns and there are risks, you know, there are known risks and there are unknown risks. So you should definitely cover the known risks and unknown risks you have to take as they come, but be prepared and don't panic. I think that's what you're saying and soldier on. Okay. Um, well, uh, those are the questions. We have a couple of more questions. I don't know from the organizers whether we can continue to take them. You so may I want just to want to add one answers. more. So Akbar, uh, Akbar, who's asking this question, I want to just say one thing that it's good to be in a network. It's true for social startups. It's true for NGOs. Many NGOs who became the member of RCRC, this became a place for them to talk about how the community was suffering, first of all. Second, we are all livelihoods NGOs, 99%. We didn't know how to handle COVID, what were the symptoms and how to solve uh, the sickness, even among the uh, staff members. So we, this platform became a learning platform and fortunately, we had uh, Jan Swas Sayo, which is a health NGO set up by six AIMS graduates. Dr. Raman Kataria and Dr. Yogesh Jain, they taught us uh, the symptoms, how to diagnose. And so being part of a network, uh, same thing in Buddha Fellowship, we have set up a Buddha Entrepreneurs Network. So they, in fact, uh, supply to each other also. Millets from Uttarakhand are coming 
Satyam is collecting uh, millets from there and Kaushal is selling in Bangalore. So I think being part of a group, being part of the network, being part of a club, not necessarily we can have club for bridge, we can have club for golf, we can have club for whatever. The being part of a social group is very useful when we have crisis in, at our store staff. So that's the one thing I wanted to just build on. I'm requesting and suggesting many NGOs here to become a member of a network. And that way they can also work with the government. Like RCRC has a big member of our MOU with the government of India to transform 100 districts. It is possible because government looks at us as one place. They can come to their 80 NGOs. They can help us. And we come with some specialization in livelihoods. So we provide something also. So this relates to how we can actually grow individual this thing. So Amar Bhaskarji is asking, shall I answer that question? Yeah. <laughs> or we have time, I do not know. No. A quick one, sir. No yeah. Uh, yeah, we can probably end with that. Yeah, so, yeah. so I think uh, I have the fresh examples from RCRC. During COVID, small NGOs would suffer more also because of FCRA. Onward granting was not possible. We collected money on behalf of RCRC, small scale organizations from Dasra, from Edel Grow Funds, and from uh, Give India, and from Omidyar, and from Gates Foundation. Altogether, we raised about 40 crores, and uh, small organizations benefited. I would also say, for example, in one case, out of the 10 organizations, Dasra gave money to. Three, they gave about 75 lakh rupees each, like $100,000. Seven, they gave 10 lakh rupees again. So what I'm saying is funding is also important to be speaking to donors together. And there is money for small NGOs also. People are looking for things. Why give money all the time to Srijan? Give money to small NGOs also. So RCRC can act, some of these networks can act like a uh, people who can verify, who can validate. This is a great NGO. You can give. So crypto gave about 12 crore rupees to us. Crypto relief. 12 crore rupees to 20 NGOs. They never asked once as to who you are recommending. And recently, Assam floods, right? So we have approached donors and they are saying, okay, we would be able to help out. Gates Foundation is saying we will help out. Again, it will give us thing, we will help out. So a network can be a place where uh, we can uh, become a uh, sort of a, uh, in some way, quote unquote, a verification for a good NGO also. So that's <laughs> just one thing I wanted to say. Future way of funding, I would look at not only institutional funding, I think we should look at crowdfunding also because you can escape from the regulatory uh, sort of uh, things. If you say go, Milap is one very good example, which is there. And Rangde is another example, which is in Bangalore, what Ram is doing, is providing money to SSGs. And we have also partnered with, with them. So I think another way to look at is whether message can reach a common man on Church Street or on Teresandra, wherever, that you know we, there are people who are doing good work. And I say it for fund, not for funding only, but I think the good work, good word about good work should reach common middle class person in India. For that reason alone, I think it is important to look at quote unquote crowdfunding and so on. Yeah. So that's a, we could probably close, I think. That's what I yep. get the signal. So yeah. It's a real, uh, real pleasure before I hand out to the organizers with, uh, there's so many things to talk about, but you're given uh, the future in terms of what one needs to do and not necessarily dwell on the past because the future is changing and the future is bright in terms of the, in terms of India as an economy. Uh, we couldn't cover education. I would have loved to do that, but maybe for another day because making changes in the education system will really lay a solid foundation to the future generations and what can be done. So maybe there's a dialogue for another day on education for social sector. You know, we have got education, which is liberal arts, but liberal arts is a slightly esoteric subject. We need uh, liberal social education probably also requires discussion for another day. Over to Prakalpa Saujanya organizer.
users. Thank you once again for the opportunity, uh, Prakalpa and uh, SVYM. Thanks, Anand. Thanks. Thank you, Ved. We started with the topic, we energize, we energize the development sector <laughs> in a complex and unpredictable world with a market-driven approach. And I did hear a lot of life examples that we illustrated, you know, as we spoke on this on the topic and very, very uh, pertinent questions that were discussed across with uh, good examples. I would like to now call uh, Vijay, uh, founder of uh, Prakalpa Saujanya Foundation, to give the closing comments and the word of thanks. Uh, Vijay is also from IIM Ahmedabad with a very rich experience of 40 plus years uh, in various corporate world. And the last 10 years specifically has been in the uh, social sector, in the development sector, and working closely with uh, a lot of organizations in developing uh, Prakalpa as well. So over to you, Vijay, to uh, put your closing comments. Thanks. Uh... Uh, thanks, uh, Ved, for uh, uh, coming up with such a nice uh, uh, responses and uh, alignment with whatever subject we had actually thrown at both of you. Anand, you had uh, been a kind of very thorough in terms of really picking up the brains of uh, uh, Ved in a very many, many ways. Uh, but uh, definitely, I think uh, when we were actually doing the pre -pre preparation for this particular uh, session, I think uh, Ramesh said that you know, this uh, the dialogue can go on for about uh, four hours and all. So we can go on and all because the subject is so vast and there's so much of interest. So, so nice of you for you know, being there. And uh, we do have a small video about uh, Buddha Fellowship, but I think we are run out of time. We are already uh, stretched uh, 10 minutes. I just want to request the audience to just be there for another two, three minutes. Maybe we can share the video uh, with, with your permission to various people and they can have a look at it on the, on the Buddha uh, program, which is a very, very exciting program, entrepreneurship uh, driven program uh, where uh, the, the people, a lot of example ways is already given. So just to conclude, I think some of the few things quickly, not spending uh, much time on details. I think uh, Ved and Ananda brought out just three, four key messages in terms of re-energizing how we look at the future. So definitely, I think, uh, although we are in an uncertain world, but this is not something new. Uh, the the world happens, the risks happen, and that's what we should take in stride. So we should actually uh, look at opportunities which are coming out of this particular uh, uncertainty and uncertain environment and the ecosystem, rather than just looking at, no, oh my God, I think something has really hit us bad. So therefore, we should look at positive side of it. That's what Vedis uh, always tells on all his uh, talks that, no, let's look at future. Let's not, uh, so right, I think that is the spirit, I think, which uh, Ved has uh, brought out in this particular dialogue. And of course, compassion for the community is what, which is binding us as a, as a, as a community here, as a group of people. And that's what Prakalpa, Svim, Ved, Arya, Buddha, all this region and uh, Anand and everyone was contributing towards that. And a lot of, lot many other NGO leaders on the call. So I think uh, the compassion will keep us is a DNA which will keep us uh, linking with each other and we'll be keep connecting and uh, looking at a lot of solutions uh, jointly going forward. But there are a few things which are coming out. One is obviously power of idea and the innovation and the technology, appropriate technology to be added. So power of idea, any NGO can come up. It's not any big NGOs have to do it. Even smaller NGOs can do it. So the, the, that's the power of idea. Second thing we talked about and uh, Anand Archko brought up very nicely is in terms of power of networking. You are not alone. Be part of the ecosystem. There are systems and support systems available. And uh, there are people who can help you out in terms of uh, difficulties. And then, of course, uh, uh, power of uh, getting professional strength. And uh, that's what we are looking at. Younger generation, it's our uh, uh, kind of endeavor should be that you know, we excite people, ignite people, like what uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam said, you know, igniting people for future. So I think uh, there's a lot of work we need to do as community really bring in uh, younger people into the game and uh, they can also they can bring in ideas they can bring in uh, different ways of looking at it they can think about value chains in a very different way so i think uh, bringing on the igniting younger generation into into this particular domain is is also extremely going to be really helping us out and then of course uh, uh, the things like uh, 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 constraints in terms of uh, policies 
and the compliance burden i think with the changes in the environment economic systems and various other things happening we have, we, we kind of we, we all of us i say we thrive because of you know globalization i think there is a reverse globalization and barrier is going to come more and more in the future so i think we should be prepared for how do we manage this compliance burden and uh, nand talked about uh, using technology in prakalpa we also talk about being data driven be using technology make your life little easier in terms of how you can manage your processes and you know build the responses and don't have to work hard in terms of say i got one more report in front of me i think if you are data driven probably those things can be easily managed so these are the kind of common things which kind of came out i think they are very very uh, directional and also uh, motivating elements for us to really look at in future in terms of how do we re-energize ourselves with the kind of you know state we have gone through i'm quite sure all of us have taken uh, these lessons and thanks ved thanks anand for bringing them out and uh, be part of it taking your time out of your busy schedules and being on this particular uh, dialogue and uh, we are going to obviously we are going to continue dialogues please if you have any questions you can always mail us put it on our chat or put it on our whatsapp we will definitely you know connect uh, all of you and any more people to want to look at some of the answers and also thanks to uh, uh, ramesh and we lead for giving the zoom platform and uh, thanks to everybody who who stayed back and uh, had uh, participated in in this particular you know, uh, dialogues uh, from uh, prakalpa sojanya jointly with a we lead and sym so thank you very much and uh, we look forward to meeting again for one more exciting uh, development sector dialogue uh, next month fourth saturday 5 to 6 pm we are trying to pull in somebody who can talk about uh, csr perspective corporate csr perspective into ngo so we are trying to look at a person who can really do it if you can get it even otherwise that dialogue will happen so thank you very much and uh, keep in touch thank you so much and as a safe week thank you very much thank you so much thank, thank you everybody thank you, all. thank you have a nice weekend thank, thank you. you everybody bearing with me thank you bye ved thank you thank, thank you, you so much. much thank you thanks anand thank you thank you, thank you. bye anand bye vijay yeah, bye everybody bye bye everybody bye. thanks thanks thank you for all your participation